First of all, let me say why it's important, because uh, until evolution came along, until we had Darwin, uh, it, the most outstandingly surprising thing about the world would have been the extraordinary complexity of living things and the fact that they looked as though they'd been designed. Nobody could look at an eye or a heart without thinking, gosh, that was pretty cleverly designed to see or to pump, whatever it is. What Darwin did was to show that the illusion of design of something like an eye or a heart can come about through purely mechanical, physical processes without any design whatsoever. And it works like this. I'm going to work backwards. You could easily understand getting an eye from something that was almost an eye, starting with something that hadn't quite got to the point of being an eye, but almost had. And then once you've got that, you go back a stage further and you could explain how you could get that from something that was almost an almost an eye. And so on, back, 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 through millions of years until you get no eye at all. That's one way of looking at it. The forward way of looking at it is to say, in every generation, this would be Darwin's way, in every generation you have variation which is under genetic control. Not all animals are equally good at surviving. The ones that are best equipped to survive are the ones that do survive and therefore they pass on to the next generation the equipment to survive. Nowadays we would say the genes for building the eyes or whatever it might be. In every generation some animals are more likely to die than others, some animals are more likely to reproduce than others. They are the ones that pass on the genes that make them good at surviving and reproducing. In the, whatever particular way the animal concern survives, if it's a, a land-dwelling animal, these are genes for running fast, for hunting well, for seeing well, for smelling well. If it's a dolphin or a fish, these are genes for swimming well. If it's a bird, these are genes for flying well. Whatever it takes to survive for the particular species, those animals that do survive will pass on the genes for being good at surviving. Over many, many generations, the, the world becomes more and more full of genes that are good at surviving, good at reproducing. It takes a very, very, very long time. Fortunately, we have a very, very, very long time. Geology gives us approximately four billion years of Earth history since roughly when the origin of life occurred. During that time, life started off perhaps as something rather simpler than a bacterium. It went through the bacterial stage for about the first couple of billion years. It then produced rather more complex cells, which are called prokaryotic, sorry, eukaryotic cells, which are the cells that we're made of. The eukaryotic cells club together to form so-called multicellular animals, animals that are made of lots of different cells. At every stage, the progeny generation would not have been noticeably different from the parent generation. You would not have noticed the difference if you'd been there. But if you come back a million years later, you would have noticed the difference. The change is so slow, so imperceptible, that you can't actually see it happening, or you're lucky if you can. In the same way as you can't actually watch a child growing up, and yet you know that after a number of years, the child is noticeably bigger. In the same way, you couldn't actually see evolution happening. But after a million years, you can notice substantial evolutionary change. For example, in a million years since Homo erectus walked the earth, there have been noticeable changes in the anatomy. Uh, in the uh, 65 million years since the dinosaurs went extinct, most of the mammals have evolved. These are spans of time which is extremely hard for the human brain to grasp, which is one of the reasons why people have such difficulty in understanding evolution. The bottom line is that Evolution has given us an explanation which we now know to be the correct explanation, it's factually true, has given us the correct explanation for the existence of 
the whole of life and we no longer need to resort to concepts like design. If you want to resort to concepts like design, you can do so if you wish, but only by some kind of circumlocution, such as saying, oh well, the designer chose evolution by natural selection in order to do his designing in a very roundabout, indirect way it was too. Can I just take you back for a moment, Richard? You say that we know that this is true. What, what is the evidence for evolution? There are about half a dozen different strands of evidence. <clears throat> for me, the most convincing evidence comes from modern molecular biology. If you, as, as you know, ever since uh, the Watson and Crick revolution from 1953 onwards, we know that all living creatures have in every one of their cells a very long piece of text which is spelled out in letters of DNA. And it's now possible to look at the exact sequence of letters. It's exactly like reading the characters in a book. So you can take any two animals you like, say a mole and an aardvark, or a human and a kangaroo, or a rhinoceros and a baboon. Take any two animals you like, and you can look at the exact sequence of letters in their DNA, and you can compare them letter by letter by letter for billions of letters. This gives you billions and billions of comparisons. And lo and behold, when you do that, when you compare any two, two animals and then any other two animals, and then compare one of those to one of those, one of those to one of those, in a, in a branching tree pattern, a branching tree pattern is exactly what you see. The pattern of resemblances between the code letters in any pair of animals you look at follows exactly the pattern you'd expect if it was a family tree. It is a family tree. Moreover, you can do that for each different gene separately. So you can, you can draw out a family tree for gene A, and you draw out a family tree for all the different animals, then you draw out a family tree for gene B, and lo and behold, it's the same family tree. For gene C, it's the same family tree. Even better, there are lots of genes that don't actually do anything, the so-called pseudogenes. They're rather like the, the mess that's on your hard disk. If you look on the hard disk of your computer, bits of the data that are there are words that you have actually, you remember composing. They're part of the, the chapter you're working on, whatever it might be, the letters you're writing. But the, the hard disk is covered with all sorts of other stuff. Maybe discarded remnants of old bits of writing, whatever it might be. The equivalent of that in the genome is pseudogenes. They're not doing anything. Once upon a time they probably did do something, but they no longer do. And exactly the same story pertains, exactly the same branching family tree you find, even with these pseudogenes that aren't doing anything. I think that's the most persuasive evidence for evolution. There's plenty of other evidence. The evidence from the geographical distribution of animals. Animals and plants, if you look at where they are on the islands and continents of the world, which side of mountain ranges they are, which side of rivers they are, they're exactly where they should be. If we were like detectives, who'd come on the scene after the event and looked at the clues and said, this is exactly what we should see if evolution had happened. Similarly, the fossil record is exactly what we should see if evolution had happened. Comparative anatomy is exactly what we should see if evolution had happened. There is no longer the slightest shadow of a doubt that evolution is a fact. That's not to say that natural selection, Darwin's theory of evolution, is the only theory that accounts for it. But evolution itself is a fact. It is a fact that we are cousins of monkeys, we are closer cousins of apes, we are more distant cousins of cats, more distant cousins still of octopuses, and so on.